In the 1920s, Italian immigrant Simon Rodia started to build a series of spires in his Watts backyard. He said he wanted to build something beautiful as a tribute to his adopted city, so he made the towers from what he found around him, garbage. The job took him 33 years, and after he completed it, he handed the deed to a neighbor and vanished, never to return. In the wake of World War II, a new generation of renegade artists decided to stay in L.A. and make a go of it. Choosing to ignore the art history that New York dictated, they looked around to the ugly boulevards, automobile graveyards, the flashy billboards, to find inspiration and called it art. The place where they found each other was called Ferris. There is this tendency out here just to not care about art history, but it's because we're a young city, we're not an old city, we're not surrounded by art. We don't have to deal with our past because there is no past. Even though we didn't have enough evidence, we were completely confident that we were on the right track and everybody else was full of shit, you know? The work that was going on here in the early 60s was as important as any work being made anywhere in the world. Yeah. We got something that's different out here and we can compete with New York. And that's cultural ambition. They had a pool of interesting artists and something was percolating. And then you got the spark, the Ferris Gallery. Over a decade, starting in the late 1950s, Los Angeles built an art scene from scratch. In those years, LA came to host Andy Warhol's first gallery show. Oh. Marcel Duchamp's first retrospective, and build the foundations of a modern art market. At the scene's center was the brilliant autodidact Walter Hopps and the smooth as silk Irving Blum, whose Ferris Gallery allowed young Los Angeles artists to develop groundbreaking work that today can be seen in museums around the world. It was a heart-pounding, romantic scene with all the right people and they were all doing the right things and they were it was a daring time i saw a lot of things and i learned a lot of things because the work was really special you know art you're out there so you feel like it's scary you you don't know what people are going to think of some of the things you do paris dumped on new york and new york ends up dumping on la and all of a sudden it's there you know and the lights are on, the camera's rolling, the, the, the sound is cool, and somebody says, okay, guys, you're on. The old Plaza Church in the Mexican quarter of the city of Los Angeles is a quaint reminder of the days when California was under the flag of Spain. For nothing determines the progress of a community so much as the development of its cultural arts, and it has been the good fortune of Los Angeles County to have concentrated within its boundaries a large proportion of the best that America has to offer in this respect. In the late 40s, early 50s in Los Angeles, it was a wasteland. L.A. in those days was extremely conservative. There wasn't even a French restaurant in L.A. that I can remember, except there were two restaurants that were filled with Hollywood film people and you couldn't get in unless they knew who you were. I had no notion that Los Angeles existed as an art community whatsoever. It was some kind of miasmal mist in the distance. It's all it was to me. We had no magazine here. There was no art form. There's not life and time and news. We never had art sections. So whatever information we got was very slow in coming. There was a whole lot of Paul Clay looking things, a whole lot of semi-cubism, kind of stuff you see in Laguna Beach. Now you saw then in La Cienega, a lot of pretty meaningless galleries. The LA County was like pitiful in terms of, of its uh, modern art holding. It had a lot of art cast-offs, you know, like uh, something, uh, something out of Picasso's you know, wastebasket. The museum didn't like contemporary art. 
You know the stories about Rick Brown buying the Jackson Pollock and they wouldn't let him hang it. And he said it was for educational purposes and so the board said, well, if somebody wants to see it, then you come up and hold it for them and then take it back to the racks. You know? Oh, you have to understand that abstract expressionism was the only true art, you know, the Holy Grail and everybody in L.A. hated it and actively tried to suppress it. It was communist, it was anarchist, it was ugly, it was mindless, you know, there was a whole war against it. The Los Angeles Board of Supervisors had derailed citywide arts fairs under the banner of communist infiltration claiming as proof that a painting of a sailboat was, in fact, concealing a hammer and sickle. By the mid-1950s, public art in Los Angeles was all but dead. I got started because in my generation in Southern California and people older than me, there were very few who were even responding to the art I was interested in. I couldn't see it. It wasn't there. When I met Walter Hopps, he seemed a bit apart from the artists that I had been dealing with. We thought he was in the CIA always. I think you know that. You've heard that from him. Walter Hopps was always a very mysterious person to me. CIA or FBI kind of guy. Talked very quietly and in secrets all the time. Everything he said was a secret. He told me this. I said, why are you dressed like this? He said, because I have to be the businessman. Outside of anybody else who's not a painter, I can't think of anybody that I know who has as good an eye as Walter. That's one of the reasons why I would forgive him for a lot of the dumb things that he's done. Walter is the man who discovered it all. <laughs> Walter's the man who fed it all and had it. He's the, he's the engine. He's, uh, you know, everybody, everybody's riding on his bubble. He's down underneath holding it all together. It's no, there's no tree without, without Walter. French artist Marcel Duchamp, the father of Dadaism, frequently visited the Los Angeles home of his benefactors, the Ahrensbergs. As a high schooler in art class, Walter Hopps met Duchamp on one of these trips and fell in love with his style and intellect. The kind of art that was involved was what I generically called the New American Art. And that's the larger world of abstract expressionism, which was an extraordinary revolution. It wasn't getting shown in any of the galleries in Southern California. and it was almost not there in the museums, almost not there. Hop soon realized that for Los Angeles to develop a real art scene, it needed a handful of elements. Artists to make the work, galleries to support it, critics to celebrate it, museums to establish it, and collectors to buy it. He then spent the next decade putting those pieces together. When Walter became involved in avant-gardism, beat generation avant-gardism. It was more through music than it was through the art. One, two, three, four. About the same time we got interested in art, we got interested in jazz. All the artists liked white jazz during that period. Artists kind of working and living in isolation during the 50s naturally found expression. Many of them became visual artists, many of them became poets, many became musicians. There was a relationship between all of these in a way that doesn't exist anymore. We made tons of trips to San Francisco, both for the jazz and to look at, at the work, and so we just went in and met, met everyone up there. Abstract Expressionism was a post-war movement which dispensed with figures entirely, making the painting 
only an image of itself. San Francisco, long center of the West Coast art scene, had its own vibrant school of abstract expressionism which developed the same time as New York's, but with much less fanfare. You know, I'll be very honest with you. What was going on in the Bay Area was very exciting work, and we were very proud of it. Uh, and I think we considered L.A. very important. There were so many people, uh, and, and the market was more in Southern California in those days, as it turned out. And none of the extraordinary San Francisco people were getting seen. There was something about Walter that really wanted somehow to bring things to the public. It was something that he, he loved doing and, and felt a kind of conviction about it. In 1954, Walter sold his collection of stamps and war bonds to help start an avant-garde art gallery in West L.A. called Sindel Studio. It seemed not like a real gallery because though there were openings, there weren't very many people. It was on a, a sort of a hideaway street and it seemed like you were almost worked for being shown in one of your friends, uh, you know, rented storefronts. There was a kind of wonderment of what on earth was going on here. And the one role that I did play was that there was something legitimate about me. At least I was a PhD student. I was, you know, I was studying art history. The amazing thing about Walter is that he was a biochemistry major. He wasn't formally trained as an art historian. There he showed the Bay Area painters he loved and began drawing on the local artists he found in the far corners of the city. This is the grandeur that was Venice, California. Over the years it has become a slum complete with canals and oil wells that pump out all the wealth. Venice has become a backwater of Bohemia in Los Angeles. But only the most beat of the beatniks remain, tapping out their pathetic rhythm of protest. In those days, there were like two kinds of artists. There were those of us who were teaching, who were basically wusses, because we wanted a salary and security and stuff like that. Then there were the real artists, guys who were living by their wits and renting storefronts down in Venice. Venice, uh, at that point, was like sort of the end of the world. There were empty beachfront lots, there were oil wells, Derek standing. It was like a place where people could go and vanish, or they could go and create new worlds, and no one would know it. It was cheap. Nobody wanted to be here. But look, you can see the ocean right there. You could live a bohemian life and not be in great danger. The worst we would ever have would be some nodding off heroin addicts in the, in the stairwell or alcoholics. It was really on the wine belt where all the studios were. The thing that's hard to imagine today is what a microcosm the whole art world was at that time. I can compare it to the surfing world. I think I knew every surfer that existed in 1950. I think I knew every artist that existed in 1957 or 58. It was just that small. California was raw. No one gave a shit out here about the artists and what they were doing. Of course, we all thought we were great. Walter was always in the background of these things. He was the one letting everyone know who were the artists worth looking at. He was like the explorer who comes back and reports on his discoveries. Assemblage was a style that took society's debris and created works of deep social conscience. In Los Angeles, the ephemeral city, a handful of artists pioneered a distinctly West Coast approach to assemblage. Amongst its leaders was Walter's newest cause, Wallace Berman. When someone came in from out of town, 
it was hip to what was going on, they contacted Wallace Berman, Wally Berman. It was Wally then, and gathered at his place. Just for the, the love and friendship of it. Of course, they were sharing art on a level, but you know, you just wanted to go see the guy. He was the one who said you could be an artist, a real artist, in Los Angeles and that you could live a life of poetic poverty. Walter collected odd characters like that and discovered them and sort of made them more visible in a way. We knew a lot of these people by way of Walter. Berman brought together poets, musicians, and artists, not only in his life, but in Semina, the magazine he edited. But the man who took assemblage farthest was Ed Keenholz, who chewed on the bones of Los Angeles like a man on a mission. I arrived in Los Angeles flat broke. Out of necessity, I'd live off the fringes of society like a termite. Finally, the, the environment that I was in changed the type of thinking and the type of painting that I do. I decided it was perhaps more honest for me to take a head and paint it than to paint a head on canvas. I also discovered Edward Keenholz who'd come into the city, settled down, and by that time was running a little uh, gallery over on La Cienega called the Now Gallery. Ed Keenholz was, uh, he was like a roofer. He would change your tires. He would do, he was able to do everything, an every man, everything kind of man. And he was a trader. He, he'd like to swap people art for cars and art for things, and he was always making deals. You've got a 53 Cadillac door over there, I want. That, that yellow one that's stuck over there in the, in the rack. Is it damaged at all? Yeah. How much? We're going to get at least $25. Where's all the, it's got a all big right. dent down it. All right, all right. That's right Everything we got is always junk, Ed. <laughs> I'll give you 10 bucks for the damn door. He was too embarrassed to show his own work, so then he had to show other work. Meanwhile, Walter was doing the same thing, but with more expertise than Ed had, and then they uh, put it together. I think that was a natural marriage. Walter was like flypaper. Artists would come to him and flock to him, and Ed was getting to learn about the art scene in L.A., and here they could actually make this thing happen. Yeah, well, by the mid-50s, half-conscious strategy was to see how many different galleries there could be. Ah, oh, lights. Fantastic. Anyway, we moved from uh, Now Gallery in Sendo into uh, Paris, original Paris. You know what La Cienega means? In Spanish, it means the swamp. And that street was originally a black swamp where oil is bubbling up. So along comes a, a little bitty gallery in the back of the back that showed uh, San Francisco and LA abstract expressionists and, and assemblage artists, which was radical. suddenly have a, a, an art gallery on La Cienega. That was quite a, a leap forward from anything. Uh, most of the artists had considered being part of their world. Well, you would think of Ferris as a gallery that was representing beat generation aesthetic is really what it would amount to. People like the Northern Californians, like Bruce Conner, Jada Feo, uh, Sonia Getkoff, uh, I think Jim Kelly, if I'm not wrong, people like that. Well, first of all, it was the first gallery to show the Bay Area artists uh, on such a scale, to give solo shows, you know, to take big paintings and put up big shows of the work. And 
Now the first show was an extraordinary show of California and uh, not a single thing sold. The early Ferris was a little bit like a big happening and every exhibition was you didn't quite know how it was going to happen, how it was going to come out, what it would be like. In the first opening that mother came down to visit and Bob Alexander took off his pants and it, I mean it was tough. You have to also remember that it was a very heavy drug culture. Crazy. It was crazy. They had crazy openings there. Art was clearly an alternative. We were young, the world was dangerous. Art is romantic. If you don't think you're going to live past 30, or you like the drama of pretending you really believe that, of course you don't, but it allows you to act with a certain amount of freedom and chances to do things that you might not otherwise consider. The art of this particular generation, which was, as most art is, initially dissonant. Uh, so when it says, for us, it means not for you. <laughs> It's so different from the way it is now. There were so few people who cared, so many people who laughed. I hated to sit in the gallery because I hated it when people came in and thought what we were showing was junk or something like that. At that point in time, nobody was really that interested in art. Nobody was that interested in art. You could go to the, the Ferris Gallery and maybe five people would come in during a day or what have you. The gallery helped make ends meet with the help of a little old lady from Pasadena, Sadie Moss, who believed in what Ferris was doing, even if she didn't understand it. They were working for art, man. They, they were, were working, working for art, I don't period. Think any, any, any of them were doing anything they, they, they were doing, they were making, I mean, sure they put, were oh, I made that, and then I make, oh, coming. I made that, and that's all as far yeah. as it went. Yeah. And somebody else then, you know, oh, you should have an exhibition or something, you know. Yeah. And like, you know, I, you know, they were making art. Amidst the San Franciscans at Ferris were a group of L.A. artists who formed into a clique that would grow to define the scene. In Los Angeles, there were a group of artists who were breaking from abstract expressionism in very important ways and at exactly the same time that they were in New York, without any connection between the two. There's always a kid in your class who can uh, draw amazingly, and that was Kaufman. I think it was 53 that the avant-garde for Paris show came to Los Angeles County Museum, and that had a big effect on me. I changed from being a Paul Clay painter to trying different things. I think there's no question about the fact that Craig was the information catalyst. Craig stimulated them toward making art that was really contemporary in terms of its feel and its, and its attitude. I was sharing a studio with Craig Kaufman at the time. Craig was definitely the best artist of all of us in the beginning. And he would sit there and muse for like, you know, half an hour and I'm, I'm putting paint on your mother. And then he'd walk across and go, and put a little wiggle there, you know, and you go back and sit down for another half an hour. But what I discovered from that at a certain point is I looked at my own paintings and I realized that they were, they were deeply superficial and the obvious thing was that I was deeply superficial. I made a very simple idea and that was that everything in the painting either contributes to the whole or by its being there, it subtracts from the whole. And that's what started me on that catharsis. So I had this whole wild thing and it ended up finally with two straight lines. John Altoon, he was the glue of the whole group. John was the most brilliant, most talented, most vivacious. Christ, he was everything. Altoon was the model of the way an artist should be. It was sort of wild, unpredictable, irascible. His drawings are just like uh, nervous energy. They're just absolutely most direct from mind to hand to thing I've ever seen in a, with no no filtration in between nothing Ferris also nurtured the ceramic revolution 
launched by Peter Volkus, who helped transform clay from a crafts material to something with the avant-garde potential of paint. Following his lead were Ferris artists Ken Price and John Mason, who created their own groundbreaking clay works. Peter and I had at the studio on Glendale Boulevard, and we had a big kill at that time. Our plan was to make some larger ceramics that, that hadn't been possible previously. The crafts hierarchy, or whatever you want to call it, was very much in force then. And so one time, Bingston and I went to uh, see this guy demonstrate, and it was Volkus, and he just blew our minds. Everybody that uses clay owes him kind of a debt because he's the guy that broke the whole thing open. When they started showing artists like Kenny Price, each of these objects was presented as a very precious, special little object. Can you imagine a funny, dumpy clay cup becoming as interesting, let's say, as a Fabergé egg of one kind or another? My brother told me that uh, they were hanging art on a recent evening, about two in the morning, and the police came by and said, what are you doing? And the cops said, oh, it looks like you're hanging up wet Levi's on the wall out there. And, you know, it did look like wet Levi's. I'd seen first in my lifetime modern art totally ignored. Then I saw it condemned as being communistic. Then I saw it condemned as obscenity. I wonder what will come next. But here's the infamous Berman. Try and get it so there's some light on it. Wally Berman really had a very private feeling of an artist. So when the opportunity to have this show at the Ferris occurred, it was like an enormous step for Wally to take, to suddenly be out in the open. I saw a regular art gallery turned into a temple. And that alchemical function of an artist w was so appealing to me that I, to this day, that's, that's what I want to do. And the irony of it is that this temple is then turned upside down and called obscene and closed by the vice squad. Yes, I was there the day that the, this, this bust happened and you know, these cops come in, they stopped in the black box and there in one of the uh, cards that had uh, had a drawing on it by Cameron and an artist in that circle. And all of a sudden, like, you know, it was like the sun had gone under. And at that point, they arrested Wally and they took him out to the police car, took him away. I thought it was ridiculous. How could they, how could the police come in? I worked in a club, the Unicorn, that had comedians, and Lenny Bruce worked there. They came in and busted Lenny for saying shit. It was the same kind of mentality that went after Wally Berman. I remember sitting in the courtroom, and Wallace got up and went over, the, there was a blackboard, took a piece of chalk and wrote, there's no justice here, only revenge. Bang and sat down, and uh, still, he was guilty. Shortly thereafter, Wally and Shirley left town. He regarded this as a location of a real defeat, a really painful experience. Walter, it's a fast city. Love, Wallace Berman, 1964. But that's uh, something I indeed treasure. By the end of the 1950s, Walter had convinced Keenholz that he should dedicate himself full time to his art, leaving Ferris in flux. I needed to have a partner. 
to front the gallery, to actually be in there. And this person from out of town had showed up one weekend at the old Ferris. Clearly the gallery that was the most energetic as well as the most chaotic was the Ferris Gallery. It represented something like 70 people at the time. All of a sudden this guy in a very overt sort of Cary Grant accent said, Ah, Esther, ah, Adolf, it's so great to see you. And starts explaining the gallery to him and showing them around like it was his. I walk up to him and I say, I'm Walter Hopps. I think you and I should go have a drink so you can tell me what the hell is going on here. I introduced myself, told him a little something about my history, and uh, we went to his club, Barney's Beanery, and uh, talked. Well, Irving reminded me of Cary Grant. In those days, he was like Cary Grant. He looked like Cary Grant. Talked with that imitation Cary Grant accent. Irving was, you know, Cary Grant in drag, you know, in a, in, in a way. Is this John Doe? That's boy, son, John Doe. Oh, this is John Doe. John Doe. And this is the family group. And if Irving hadn't gotten involved, it probably would have died because I w was certainly not ready to commit my life to it. And uh, Walter might have been, but he had to have a surrogate of some sort. Walter and Keenhold somehow managed to scrape up enough action to hold things together. But Irving actually tried to make some money. His idea was that this stuff is of value. The gallery moved across the street because the gallery where it was, was very choppy. We needed a cleaner space. I remember the word Ferris outside had this kind of magic to it. Ferris had a much sparer approach to showing art. If you wanted to put a tiny painting on a single big wall, you're welcome to it. The artist is the boss. It gave art that was difficult and advanced a kind of cachet and made it look like it mattered even if you couldn't understand why on earth anyone would think that. Irving has tremendous taste and tremendous style. His announcements, the graphics he did himself, you know, they were all quite beautiful. I came over and I was talking to Irving and Irving said, excuse me a minute, and he got up Somebody had parked a Rolls Royce across the street. And uh, so Irving went and stood in front of the Rolls Royce, had Seymour shoot his picture to send to his mother in Phoenix, saying, I'm doing all right in LA, mother, don't worry about me. You don't want people to know that you're hungry. And this was one way to convince them that we weren't. <laughs> and a lot of people, I think, were convinced. Irving. I think gave it a bit of class. Wealthy people felt comfortable walking into that situation, whereas if it had been left up to Walter, it would have been full of students and beatniks and uh, ex-beatniks and, and so on. But somehow or another, between the two of them, uh, they got a cross-section of, of the most interesting people uh, around L.A. Walter was always moving out, trying to include more and more and more. Irving was always winnowing down. You know, we can't include everybody, Walter, but Walter would have included the world. It was the fruition at that time of the California artists that were my friends, and there was sort of a diminution of the Northern California because they were more avant-garde before, and they just sort of got <laughs> stuck in the mud. When Irving came to the um, Ferris Gallery, that nucleus were already there. Yeah. Walter already had had them there. He just took them and moved them across the street. We finally shaved the number of people down to about, oh, I would say a dozen and a half. 
and uh, pretty much stayed with those people. You might have a big reputation in uh, L.A., but you were small potatoes com compared to New York. And uh, if, 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 the, those few artists that did get shows in New York got routinely trashed, just not because of the art, just but because they weren't suffering like New Yorkers suffer. The, one of the reasons I didn't go to New York is I paint outside, and you can't do that in Manhattan. You can't get the space, and of course the weather is prohibitive, right? Craig Kaufman tried to live there, I tried to live there, but it just didn't fit. My rationale was it's all set up for the artist to make it in a, in a business sense. It's all set up. California wasn't. It was raw. The idea of a career uh, was not an issue for any of us because if it had been, uh, we would have, like all sort of generations before you, we were all left LA and gone to New York because that's where careers are made and where money was made. There were a total of uh, eight or ten collectors in the entire country that we saw maybe on a regular or irregular basis. If there were eight or ten who came to us in New York, there were two or three in California all together. God's name. To buy something from the Leo Castelli Gallery or from Sidney Janis in New York, it came with provenance. There was no real provenance amongst uh, some little unknown gallery called the Ferris Gallery, or so they believed. Uh, but that changed. What do you do? Push it? Pull it? I don't know. The collectors took an extension course at night from Walter at UCLA, and Walter was like 21 years old. Michael, you remember saying... Uh, Walter would simply talk to us about the art that he loved and knew about. He opened my eyes to how to look at this stuff. That's what Walter did. He educated young couples like us at that time so that we would become collectors. They didn't have any patrons, so he went out and he educated people so they would become patrons. Ed told us that if he's Later. ever made anything that could be called art, this is that piece. If you can get past the content of it, this is a very formal piece. There were very few collectors. That part was true and a lousy critic, I mean, really a, a deadly critic by the name of Henry Seldes, who uh, was critical of every exhibition we ever did at Ferris. This is the opinion of Henry Seldes, art editor of the Los Angeles Times. Mr. Keenholz is no doubt sincere in his creations, but since they have no aesthetic value whatsoever, they can hardly be called art. We succeeded in bringing uh, Art Forum down from uh, San Francisco. They had offices on the second floor, right over the gallery, and uh, the writing greatly improved. Well, when Art Forum came, it was fabulous. All of a sudden, we were on the map. In the days of Art Forum, there was always you know, the complaint that New York is so insular and they don't believe anything goes on outside of New York. And that was true to a large extent. Uh, they couldn't have cared less about what was happening on the West Coast until it became impossible not to. Uh, this is a painting from uh, uh, like 1960 or maybe 61 and it's painted by Billy Al Bankston, who had an exhibit at the Ferris Gallery. He painted pictures of his uh, motorcycle and uh, parts of his motorcycles. It was kind of a landmark exhibit at the time. And out of Billy Al's work, you had that really very fine expression of the, of the sort of light and palette and highly skilled technique that was to come out of the Los Angeles group. Well, the interesting thing was what Kenny Price took with it was, well, wait a minute, we don't need to kind of 
abstract expressionist up ceramics in order to make it art, we can actually make the ceramics and just make them so right there that they turn into art. And out of that, links directly to the sensibility for pure, clean materials like cast resin and when something is just, you know, really nice and tight and cherry like that. They, in a way, play out all the Los Angeles prejudices. They were very involved with the beach and with the surf and with the road and with the automobile and with the girls and with the local tavern at Barney's. I mean, that's what they did. They had a lot of spare time. But the studio was a very different place. When they got in the studio, they were alone. And they all were born with the legacy of modernism. In other words, you didn't look at the external world for your subject. Your subject came from you. I believe that there was a difference. That we were doing something not better or, or anything, but, but something different than what went on in New York. It was clean and neat and bright and to the point, and I liked it. It took me back, in a way, to my adolescence. You know how Robert Irwin always talks about car culture and fixing up cars and candy apple paint jobs, detailing and making sure the chrome was all shiny and stuff like that? That's a kind of California high school sort of phenomenon. What happened with Bankston is that some of his most interesting colors were when he picked it up from custom car culture and began to spray paint. He sprayed and rubbed out and polished and so on, just like he saw in the world of Barris and Von Dutch and so on. They were, the, the custom car culture had a real impact. I think there was always some jealousy in New York is because the people that did car finishes were better here and so you could tap into it. Well, the L.A. look was hard edge, having to do with uh, new materials, plastics, and what have you. It suited me completely. I just, you know, it suited my aesthetic. When you're raised in Southern California, you know it's a city of light and air and reflection and scintillation of, of surface. And what happened is, that they began to play with qualities of perception. Instead of it being what the Impressionists tried to do, which was to see the effect of color on light, light itself became a palpable experience of the object itself. The work at the framing shop had introduced me to glass, and I thought I'd stick a piece of glass in one of these things and see how it looked, and it looked great. I eventually decided that I was just making illustrations of volumes when what I really wanted to do was make the volumes and so I eliminated the canvas and just went to the glass. I didn't have the artistic judgment to think that these guys are ahead of everybody else but this stuff spoke to me as easily as you know a a 45 RPM rock and roll record that I like. It went down real easy. Party time. Party speedery time. Marvelous. Barney's Beanery was one of the only kind of collection points where people would meet. They had a, an actual romantic scene happening there at the time. Almost every night we went to Barney's Bean. And there wasn't much in the way of girls there. You had to bring your own girl. <laughs> it was pretty sparse as far as women went. There was a big beacon storage headquarters building here. People who made paintings or beginning to experiment with assemblages they understood themselves as workers. This place fit the style of the working class artist or writer. One time this guy walked in there and said, um, there was a flash grease fire in here, the whole LA scene would be wiped out. 
Ed was, Ed Keenholz just, that was for a long time, that was like his living room. The art, for me, took the form of environments that people go into. If the art had relations to the real world, then it was an easy transition into art. Like the beanery, you go in the beanery, uh, the damn thing is a barn. So when you walk into a museum, there's the beanery, and they say, now it's no longer a bar, it's a piece of art. You say, well, shit, it ain't that bad. I mean, you know, what the hell? No guy could get drunk in here. My drink for everybody. Yeah! That idea of making the gallery space a kind of dramatic stage or theater, that was incredible. I loved his work that he did of the, the brothels. There's a, a loneliness and a, a, a desperation. And, and A seminal show for me was Roxy's. He was the exemplar artist that could show everybody you could be big, brash, and bold and, and really do it. Keenholz, you know, was what they call a noisemaker. His stuff was vivid. It was Californian. It was noisy, it was belligerent, it was too much for me. Everybody thought they were an important figure in, in, in that group, I think. It was all kings. <laughs> it was the all king stable. Kenny Price had a cheetah at his opening. Larry Bell came back the next month with a searchlight for the gallery. They were just playing with the edge of being corny and, and a little too promoting. The idea, you know, as an artist, as a star, I mean, it goes against my grain. I think it should be about the art, not about your persona. I have nothing against drama and, and creating a little bit of stir because there's nothing happening. You might as well have some fun, you know? Everybody was macho, had wow. beavis sapata muscle, because we were men. And the idea we weren't going to be femmes. Now, of course, the whole situation is reversed. What caused them to be so macho? I think that it was probably because they didn't have much control over anything. You know, their careers, their lives. But they could control what was immediately around them, and boy, did they. They serviced the men. That's what the women did. It was as simple as that. You know, they put up with it, and they cheered, and they cried, and they cooked. It wasn't easy to be around this group. Even the guys, it wasn't easy to be around, you know? I mean, there was a, it was tough. Yeah. Just to I don't know if we can all get together like this without <laughs> Billy, you can leave at any time. <laughs> if you... I was having a show and got it up on the wall and had this epiphany in which I realized how shitty it was. I mean, it was, I mean you know, that amazing moment, and then the doors opened. And then Craig came in, you guys, a couple of you guys, but I remember Craig, because Craig looked at the painting, and he looked at me and he said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> I used to say, John, what about the artist that just goes into a studio, paints paintings, tries to make them the best he can, what, and, and just does that? And he, would, and he said to me, Keen Holtz goes out in his pickup truck at night and tries to find them and run them down. Meaning, if you're a real guy, it's all about this power struggle. I remember, for example, when Diebenkorn was introduced by Irving and Walter. Yes. He was vetoed. He was blackballed out. Who, 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 who blackballed him? You were one of them, and he was one of them, and so was Kenny. Oh, uh, I never blackballed him. And, and you and I had an argument toe-to-toe -to -toe one night. Quite possible. Yeah. Who, who won? You were the winner because the thing is that he didn't get in. And the reason he didn't get in is that he was doing figurative painting at that time. And he had copped out 
a really tough painting, which was abstract painting. It was like really exciting to me because they were really into competition. And they were really moving things along. You know, Larry Bell doing those glass cubes and, and the technology that was being used. And Craig Kaufman using the plastics and, and, and Bob Irwin like coming in, coming out of abstract expression is the hard edge and then like, you know, developing this, those discs. Nobody in the gallery pushed the limits further than Robert Irwin. He abandoned paint altogether and sculpted art environments out of nothing more than light itself thus helping to launch the movement known as light and space. When it got down to zero in a way, is that following the same philosophic thread, that was following why it got to there, the whole thing turned around and became a complete cornucopia of everything was possible. Suddenly there was no, nothing I couldn't do. These give, uh, they give me less than a tremor of excitement. Bob Irwin, I mean, his towering pretentious work. A former student of Irwin's was Ed Ruscha, who picked up on Duchamp's concept that art lived primarily in the mind rather than the eye. Ruscha expanded this idea in his art to suggest that language could be a visual experience. Ed Ruscha would paint words so that Hollywood or standard or noise became the image so it put together the experience of the word written and the experience of the word heard within the picture itself and yet it had that very sort of sudden brash quality that you often get with pop art. Binkson made these belts for everybody in the gallery. He gave us titles. I was foreman, somebody else was president, somebody else was whatever. And the belt he made for Ed Ruscha was Water Boy. And he was referred to as the Water Boy. What a shift that's been, huh? <laughs> I didn't think Ruscha was worth anything. You know, a couple of his paintings, ones of the boulevards, and some photography he did, was uh, uh, sort of uh, fascinating. But his other works have no interest to me. It remains that way. It was really, in a sense, of uh, incredibly nurturing situation in which some really quite spectacular things came out from it. And there were a lot of people that were nurtured to it in a kind of secondary way, like Frank Gehry was very much a part of this whole uh, dialogue that was going on later in, in, the, in the thing. They were friendly and the architecture world wasn't. And I liked what they were doing and I didn't like what the architecture world was doing. And it seemed more direct and more uh, and less baloney about it. You know, I grew like from here to being around them. Now, this is a painting by Roy Lichtenstein. Uh, immediately after the cartoons in 1962, 63, he began this series of landscapes uh, this painting is called White Cloud, and it's uh, probably one of the most reductive paintings that uh, Roy ever painted. And uh, I was the first one to see it and really, really liked it. It kind of suited my uh, sensibility, and uh, I was lucky enough to be able to buy it. In 1959, Hobson Blum began making regular trips to New York to find out what young artists were up to. The first thing they discovered was pop art. Balder and Irving came through to see this artist that they'd heard about, Andy Warhol. I walked by a row of several of these soup can paintings. I got very excited and said, do you have a gallery? He said, no, I have no gallery. And I said, uh, what about a show in uh, Los Angeles? And he said, of the soup cans? And I said, yes, just the soup cans. Andy probably thought Los Angeles was glamorous. <laughs> he had many bizarre, mistaken notions like that. Oh, here's the very first poster of Andy's show. I saved it. For, I wrote a valuable rare. That was, that was Andy's first show. 
Well, everybody's been talking about the return to reality, and everybody's been saying it's a Bay Area figurative painters and and the abstract, you know, how they're going from abstraction back to the figure. But like that's already been done, you know. They're talking about the return to reality. This is our reality: the comic book and and the soup can. That's what I mean. That's really that's us, man. Irving had that simply brilliant idea from I don't know where. Well, from because he'd been to the grocery store, then he'd put them up on a shelf all the way around. When you walked in the gallery and saw these soup cans, it was just like a portrait gallery. It was amusing and funny. You know, it was just one of those times when four of us knew that we were on to something terrific. Now, the, the gallery next door put soup cans in its window and said, buy them here, they're cheaper. And that was pretty much the way the public thought. They were $100 a piece at retail. I sold four or five and then had the idea of uh, keeping them together intact. And I was able to get back the paintings I sold. Irving called and said that Andy had asked to keep the whole collection together as one thing and didn't want them sold off individually. Uh, so we all naturally agreed and said that's fine, we understand, as we were very committed. And then many years later, I discovered that Irving then owned the whole collection. And so it was worth something like, I don't know, $10 million or something. And that was the first big show they had when they brought an Eastner in. And at that point, the whole complexion of the gallery shifted. I went everybody's heard about the bird. It was a bitter pill in a way. They liked seeing the artists not here, and that, but then they sucked up some of the money. The choices were amazingly perspicacious. I mean, it was John's, and it was Stella, and it was Lichtenstein, and it was Warhol. And if you ask me, you know, under duress, these spotlights, <laughs> maybe that was the best thing that happened to L.A. art was Ferris mixing and matching the two and saying this can be co-equal. Irving is in a way the consummate professional and he went with that and I think down deep inside his favorite artist is pop art. And Walter was kind of in cloud nine when it comes to dealing with practical matters. I think we were at the gallery and Walter called from Pasadena and he said, I'm into a very, very important meeting here. We're making some really critical decisions, but I'll be there in an hour. Okay. okay. Three, four hours later, he said, I'm in downtown LA and I am involved, and you guys are, I mean, this is big, for, this is big. I'll be there in half an hour. Two hours later, he calls, I'm at the upper end of La Cienega. I've stopped for just a minute. I'm having a conversation. This is a very critical one. I'll be there in 10 minutes. And then we didn't hear from him for like a month. <laughs> Walter would go into these periods that he'd just kind of disappear and do weird things. When he was married to Shirley and they had a house, I know he disappeared for two or three days and they, no one knew where he was and it turned out he was up in the attic. <laughs> I can't think of two partners in memory who are more polar opposites than uh, Walter and Irving. It's just inevitable that they'd have problems. For a Ferris gallery of any sort, was ultimately not going to satisfy Walter. You know, he had bigger visions. He wanted to do more and include more people. Walter wants to give so Thelonious Monk the baddest concert in Carnegie Hall possible. He wants to take Irwin and get Irwin to do a straight, unfettered line across the sky. I mean, he's just going for that. What's possible? How, how far can we push it? Walter Hobbs had the offer of this curatorial position, and we spoke about it, and he seemed really like he wanted to do it. And as far as I was concerned, that was fine. And I felt 
that I could carry the gallery. Well, there was tremendous excitement with the old Pasadena Art Museum, and I was able to do, on astoundingly small amounts of money, the shows I most wanted to do. I did the first retrospective anywhere of pop art. Everybody was dealing with the Pasadena Museum because the Pasadena Museum was where Walter was, and Walter was having these incredible shows. Walter was the first one to put together uh, the Common Object Show, which is the first time Warhol and, and Roche and Lichtenstein and all these guys had been uh, uh, put together. Walter's groundbreaking show was the first to celebrate the new pop art. Roche designed a poster accordingly, calling a printing company, dictating the text, and giving the simple instruction, make it loud. Pasadena Art Museum suddenly became known for doing these very forward thinking, looking uh, shows that they weren't even doing on the East Coast. They weren't doing them in New York. This was happening in this little western town. Mais en fait, quand vous parlez d'anti-art, c'était quand même très révolutionnaire à l'époque. Oui, très révolutionnaire parce que Walter really found a niche at Pasadena Museum, and then his big, big coup was to putting on the first Duchamp retrospective. Walter so clearly was addicted to Duchamp that Duchamp was conscious of this and, and you know, made it, made it happen. Mais qu'est-ce qui vous a amené à, à organiser cette exposition ici? C'est pas moi, c'est Hubs, le Walter Hubs, le jeune directeur de du musée de Pasadena qui est venu il y a un an à peu près à New York, m'en parler et je trouvais très sympathique. Well, the Duchamp show was major, major. The impact was tremendous. It's hard to think of any one single exhibition that had the impact on this town because it came at a time when a lot of these things were gelling. It was all kind of coming together and the, and the LA County Museum was building and, and the, the gallery scene was impressing and people were actually building collections. In all of Southern California, they will begin to unfold before you the realization of a dream. A dream so exciting that it's almost the culmination of all that this great community could ever wish for. This is the opening of the new Los Angeles County Museum of Art. To the right, the Howard Amundsen Building. Isn't it beautiful? It is the most beautiful art museum in the world. Well, it, it seemed like LACMA was going to be a venue of some type. It was so goddamn ugly, though. I mean, uh, you didn't have much of it. There was not much there or there. Now, like a burst of fireworks to delight the people of this great city, our new Los Angeles County Museum of Art. When Watts erupted in race riots in the summer of 65, most of the art world barely noticed. Keenholz, however, seemed inspired. His first retrospective at the Los Angeles County Museum the next year was politically charged, but not even Keenholz expected the reaction. Keenholz show was the biggest thing that ever happened for a local person, and Keenholz said, yes, I'll do it, but I need to get half of what every ticket paid for to get in. And they sort of laughed and went along with it, never expecting that it would be lined up for four blocks to get into his exhibition because of the backseat Dodge controversy. This is KFI Los Angeles. What seems to be romantic and lovely in the dark after a few beers is really not very pretty at all, especially when you, the audience, are involved. 
when you look into it and you see yourself reflected in the mirrors in there. The minute you say that this is pornography, well then everybody lined up around the block. They couldn't wait to get in there to see, you know, pornography, which was definitely illegal. I don't see anything but a bunch of junk just thrown together and, and he calls that art. Art to me is the old masters over here in the first building. But this kind of junk that's just thrown together and a bunch of gobby paint thrown on it, to me it's horrible. I think the man's sick. Would you consider what you've seen so far pornography? No, not me. This is life. I mean, I see, I see people and things and conditions. The Keenholz exhibition was a smash, opening the door for other Los Angeles artists. In short order, Ken Price, Robert Irwin, and Billy Al Bankston all had major retrospectives at the museum. Keenholz, he's the exemplar in you can bypass New York. You do not need validation from New York if you're an artist in L.A. And you don't need to go, oh, well, I'm kind of triple A ball, and then I need to go to New York to be in the major leagues, and then I can be, you know, world class. You just... You know, New York art was becoming famous and important and valuable. So the idea that American art could be as good as any art in the world was happening. And so L.A. was getting the idea, well, L.A. art could be as good as New York art. Almost any artist that was working at the time would feel that they could possibly edge by with their art. A whole new art scene started to develop. And suddenly, within a short period of time, you had struggling young artists appearing, wearing dinner jackets at dinner parties, you know, hobnobbing with the rich and famous. And that was a new world. That was the commercialization uh, of art. I, I usually like to peg it about 65, 66. When one night, I remember specifically, Jim Elliott had a party, and suddenly it was full of women wearing their Armanis and lots of jewels and people wearing suits and ties and it just struck me something had changed there was this art boom or culture boom that seemed to be happening in america and suddenly out of nowhere it seemed to me that this all became fashionable irving i think changed a lot then he suddenly realized there's money in this well the role of the gallery is double-edged it's a curatorial role uh, whereby you make choices and then it's a financial role. It's both. And uh, you can't have one without the other, you know. Uh, so, you're caught. It's appearing to be a kind of conflict that there were artists from the Ferris Gallery I wanted to put in shows there. And I realized that I'm still sitting with a third of the stock. Ferris Gallery had started making money, by the way. What I thought was right was to just give away the damn shares to Irving. I've never given away so much in my life, never will. Well, Al Toon used to say, you know, this is all from the Bible. This guy comes, takes the man's business, then he comes and takes the man's wife. <laughs> well, Irving married Walter's wife. I think you're going to have a little trouble there. I just couldn't believe that this lovely young woman would, would leave. I could understand why she'd leave Walter, maybe, for other reasons, you know. But to go with this guy, I just, unbelievable. Their marriage really uh, was disintegrating. And so she, Shirley and I became involved, but in the least complicated way. No one's been able to live with Walter for more than, you know, 10 or 15 years. It's just really hard. But there are lots of people, myself included, who believe in him and who are willing to support him and to see him through one phase after another. Sometimes it was collectors. Sometimes it was wives. Well, 
Walter lived in a fantasy world, essentially, of his own making, which was his strength and his beauty and his Achilles heel. The only couple of times they ever nailed Walter's feet to the ground, one time when he was working in Pasadena, they just said, you can't leave until these decisions are made, and they had to put him in the hospital. And I was in the mental hospital, but I was uh, addicted to speed and had been for quite some years, and I finally crashed and burned. But uh, you just can't go on forever on four hours sleep a night, no matter what. At about 1968, there was this big buildup and then this complete drop. To a certain extent, it could have had to do with the social revolution in a, in a funny way, because that's the beginning of feminism, beginning of democracy in the arts and so forth and so on, uh, and taking the elitist edge off what was there. And, and Ferris, by that time, was an elitist activity. I got to say, when I was at Cal Arts, my whole residence was to provide another art scene other than the one that was here. So. I made sure that we hired nobody from L.A. because, you know, I said, well, there are a lot of other ways to do art than what's being done here. And, and Ferris Gallery had pretty much a, a stranglehold on what was going on here. And I said, well, this is stupid. Actually, one of the first shows we did at Cal Arts was called The Last Plastic Show. You know, suddenly the artists were making more than a good living. And, and basically, you know, money does change things. Is your mother in town? Yes. Love your work. Thank you. Thank you. Being the youngest guy around this gang, I was really of the feeling that Irwin and Bankston and Price and Moses and all of that should have had the action I was getting before I got it. So I felt a little bit undeserving. I was able to borrow really a large sum of money uh, and I gave that sum of money to Larry Bell because he couldn't work without it. The glass boxes were fiercely expensive to make and shortly after I gave him the money Billy Al Bankston came into the gallery and wanted a similar sum. He said look you've just given Larry something like 20,000 and uh, there was no way that I could do it for him and he said well Irving he said uh, I guess this is the end of the road for me, and it was. <laughs> I thought all of us artists were brothers, you know, and we were going to elevate art or something to the highest level. And it took me quite a few years to realize that all we were was whores and Irving was the pimp. And I didn't like it, and I was trying to separate it, so I had problems with that. I should say that I reject the thesis that the thing came apart on the basis of economics. First of all, we were all a group of individuals to start with. And we were together because essentially it was a, like a refuge and a support mechanism that allowed us to do what we did in a kind of vacuum. But what happened is that in time, things that held us together became less and less real or important. And the, the, the necessity of each of our uh, individual quests, what we had to do, became bigger and bigger. I began to lose interest in that gallery after a while. I mean, the kind of protein of that original gallery was uh, kind of over by that time. Everybody was, I think, in their own groove to try and build their own empire and didn't have much time to play around anymore. Everybody sort of grew up. The circle fell apart when John Altoon died, that little circle, because he could whip them into shape when they were being sibling rivals. It's a darn shame that they took him up to Camarillo and gave him shock therapy. See, I think that's what, I mean, my theory is that that's what damaged him so he had a heart attack. He didn't realize how really gifted he was. When you 
go to museums or you see them anywhere, look to see if they've been folded in half because oh, there's ones he threw away. Doesn't mean they're not good, but he threw away thousands of pieces. We were all at a party with him in Massive Art Fair. He was 45 years old. Yeah. First time anyone in that world had died, as, you know, as far as I know. And I mean, it really, you know, put a, a big lid on, on all of the, the good times that were happening for a long time. I think Irwin and, and Craig were hung on to the bitter end. Yeah, me too. I didn't. Yeah. Oh, I, is that uh, right? You did? Uh, no. I mean, when, when Ferris dissolved, when it turned into Pace Ferris or whatever that was, Ferris Pace. That was a two week they, vacation. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> um, that was the end of it for me. Well, that was the end of it. It, it, it just faded away. It's a one industry town as opposed to New York. It's really about the movie business. And unless you're directly involved in the movie business, uh, you don't get a big credential and you don't get a lot of support. It just doesn't exist. There was a real art scene that was rolling along for a few years there. And then the Ferris Gallery closed. Um, some other galleries closed. Art Forum magazine moved to New York, which was, seemed to be like a very symbolic thing to a lot of people. There wasn't enough selling going on, and Irving was beginning to sell with guys from New York. So naturally he would go migrate toward the guys that were going to sell, but he never did that well, really, here. And he finally went to New York. Irving left. Irving left. He went to New York. You can't have a gallery with a guy who goes to New York. Well, he had plenty of evidence from the very beginning that it was going to be a struggle. I guess he just couldn't really face the facts of that, that towering obstacle of the non-responsiveness to the visual arts there in Los Angeles. You know. I would say the fact that, that that generation, which was the first one that in a sense did not leave, that's why, why it's so seminal to LA. Not just, not just in terms of the quality of the artist, but the fact that it stayed in LA. Well, it's made a, it's made a, a historical imprint and effect upon the city as far, as far as its art. Every city you consider culturally, you know, it's art, it's this, it's that, it's education, it's the police and everything. Sure, it's a contribution. Uh, I think a major one. I think this, it's. I think it's beyond that. I don't think it's even like even close to having the kind of recognition that it will have in time because because the work was really special. I actually um, maybe moved away more radically than anybody else, and so maybe I have a different view of it. I look back and and with some uh, nostalgia. I mean, I, I really miss them. People's careers over the years have gone up and down, and at times they've intersected, and you know, somebody's up when other people are down, and other people are up. <laughs> That's just the way it's gone. Oh, you always were a rogue. <laughs> yeah, and on three, everybody happy? One, two, three. Perfect. It's always sad when you break up and it, you hardly ever know the reason why if we had shrinks like we have today we probably everything would be a lot different
He used to say to the younger artists, you know, you want to push me in the grave so that you can have your time. You want to get, you know, you want to push me in the grave. And so we got up there and that damn car wouldn't start. And so in fact, you know, the artists that were here, his friends, uh, younger artists, you know, pushed that car to the grave. Walter Hopps made his career here at a time when Los Angeles art was being created as a separate, distinct movement with enormous power. The power to recognize that was carried out of this place into other places, to the Corcoran, to the Manila, and he never lost touch with what was powerful. Uh, a poet, a friend of mine from UCLA, who was around the first gallery, Sindel Studio, that we had, and said, art offers the possibility of love with strangers. So that's the definition I live with. It's just too bad that Walter never wrote about it in his own inimitable style, and he was always going to do it and put the record straight because the record is, is, is going to be uh, interpreted rather than identified. And that, that's the problem with critics and everybody. They think they have to interpret what's going on, because all I have to do is see it. But they have to put a lot of baggage aside to see. And Walter had that ability to do that. Then little by little he went mad, like most of us. fascinating was how a scene like that came together out of seemingly nowhere. A bunch of artists from different places, different levels of education who had somehow found themselves living in LA, uh, getting to know each other, working together, and it was something that actually somehow had an impact on LA. LA suddenly seemed to be growing up, and then of course it moved on to another phase. I always saw Art in L.A. is like a roller coaster, you know, things happen all of a sudden and then boom, and then things happen again and then boom. And now it's been up there for a while, and, and it probably will stay. The sort of great sadness to me as I look back on it now is that in that little space, in that space of time, which was not a short period of time, there were major, beautiful works of art to be seen by anybody. You could walk in, you could get close to them, you could stay as long as you wanted. It didn't cost anything to see them. And most of the most people walked by. And, and that was sad. <laughs>